Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. Before his second coming to earth, yes, there are certain things that will need to unfold. But nothing else need happen before the rapture. That could happen at any moment, my friend. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello, friend. Glad to have you with us. You know, not too long ago, I spent a weekend talking to the church about certain end time events, things that were prophesied that were going to happen, some of them that were hidden, that God did not reveal until, you know, the, the church came in these end times. And we're going to get into a part of this right now that, uh, well, it is going to happen. I'm just telling you, it will happen. If you've got a Bible, grab it because this will not only impact you, it's going to impact the entire world. Something the scripture is very, very clear about. So we're going to get into the word. We're going to study some of these end time events. Get ready. Here's Bayless Conley with part two of his continuing message from last week. Friend, the day is coming when there will be a shout and the sound of a trumpet and those that have already died that have laid their bodies down in the earth, they'll be reunited with their bodies, but it won't be the same body, friend. It'll be a resurrected body, a glorified body, like onto his glorious body. And the moment after that, we will be caught up together with them to meet them and the Lord in the air so we will ever be with the Lord. Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. Look at it there with me. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50. And he's talking about our physical bodies being corruptible, being mortal. Verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Everyone say a mystery. All right, here's God's second secret. I tell you a secret, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, O death, or death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? My friend, the first secret was the church, the age of grace, that this season where humanity has to repent and receive mercy from God. But the second secret, and it can come at any moment, is the catching away of his church. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, those that have died in Christ will get a new body back. And the rest of us, if we're here when that happens, will be changed in a moment. Because corruption, mortality, can't inherit the kingdom of God, so we will get immortal bodies, like onto his glorious body. I love Jesus' resurrected body. He can eat honeycomb and fish and then walk through a wall. Man, I want one of those. Who knows? Maybe we'll be able to travel at the speed of thought. So it's going to be an amazing thing. And it will happen, my friend. A shout, the sound of the trumpet, in a moment, God's church, his bride, be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds. But then there's the second great prophetic event. The first one was the first coming of Christ. The second great event is the second coming of Christ to earth. The first time he came, he came as a savior to extend mercy. The second time he comes, he will come as a judge, executing wrath. The first time he came, it was to stand in our place and take the penalty for our sin and provide salvation. The second time he comes, 
is to set up his earthly kingdom and to destroy sin for all time. And friend, the second coming of Christ to the earth should not be confused with the rapture. The rapture is the return of Christ to remove all believers from the earth before the time of God's wrath and we meet him in the clouds. The second coming is the return of Christ to the earth with his saints to put an end to the great tribulation period, to defeat the Antichrist and his evil world empire. The rapture is secret and instant. But at the second coming, every eye will see him. Jesus spoke of it in Matthew 24 and verse 30, where he said, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Revelation 1 and 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. As I mentioned, the rapture is his coming for his saints. The second coming is when he comes with his saints. Look with me in Revelation, the 19th chapter, if you would. We're going to read something, and before we read it, it's important to know that throughout the book of Revelation, even previous to where we're going to begin reading in chapter 19, the picture of believers in heaven that have been there for some time, that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, they're wearing garments that are washed white and pure. It's a symbol of what the blood of Christ has done for us. So several times throughout the book of Revelation, believers that are already in heaven are wearing these white garments. We pick it up in Revelation 19 and verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Right? He's not coming to extend mercy and grace. He's coming to judge and to make war. Verse 12. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of, the, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress wine press of the fierceness of the ra and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Friend, when Jesus comes back, it will be to put down his enemies and those that have continued in wickedness and continued in rejection of God. And he will set up an earthly kingdom. But it's completely different than his first coming. You know, in Acts chapter 1, when the disciples were gathered with Jesus on the Mount of Olives, suddenly a cloud appeared and Jesus ascended into heaven on this cloud and they're standing there looking at him go up and an angel appears. He says, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing upward? This same Jesus is going to come back just as you saw him go. His feet lifted off the Mount of Olives in a cloud, and he's going to come back the same way. And you know, Zechariah chapter 14 prophesies about it, says that he will come and stand on the Mount of Olives, and it will split in two, and his saints will be with him, and he's there to execute judgment. Judges verses 14, or Jude verses 14 and 15, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment. Now, there are certainly certain prophetic events that need to come to pass before the second coming of Christ occurs. There's things that need to unfold. The rise of Antichrist, the seizing of, of the power of, of the nations and the nations being deceived. And Jesus spoke in detail 
about many of these signs that would immediately precede his second coming. In Matthew 24 and in Luke chapter 21, he spoke of wars. He said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. Nations deceived and the nations gripped with uncertainty. Great public upheaval. Great natural disasters. Earthquakes in different places. Famines. Diseases. Great persecution against believers. And a great apostasy. A great falling away from the faith. But he said also, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world to all nations as a witness, and then the end shall come. This gospel will be preached in all the world to all nations. The word nations is ethnos. Literally means every ethnic group. Jesus said every ethnic group will have a witness of the gospel before the end comes. And my friend, I don't know if you know it or not, but you are living in the only generation that has ever existed that that will be a possibility. And I know someone said, well, yeah, but I, I think there's other things that need to happen first. I agree with you. Before his second coming to earth, yes, there are certain things that will need to unfold. But nothing else need happen before the rapture. That could happen at any moment, my friend. Before I am finished preaching this message, there could be a shout and the sound of a trumpet and in a moment we're changed and caught up together with him in the clouds to ever be with the Lord. There's nothing left to be fulfilled for that to happen. Here's the question. Knowing these things, how should we be living? I think we need to live soberly, prayerfully. I think it's important that we live generously toward the kingdom because you're not taking anything with you, friend. None of it. I think we need to live filled with comfort and filled with hope. And I think we need to be doing all we can to reach people for Christ. While the opportunity is here, while the door of grace and mercy is still open. You know, in the days of Noah, as long as that door to the ark was open, there was still hope. But once God closed the door, hope was gone. Jesus Christ is our ark of safety, my friend. And right now the door is open, but it will not always be open. And I've shared this before, but it's many, many years ago, more than 30 years ago. My wife and I were at a local tailor shop. I was getting a coat altered. And this tailor was one of these guys sort of bigger than life. You know, he was a really large man. And he was um, just throwing out a, a string of cuss words really loud in his shop there. Very inappropriate. I'm with my wife. And on top of just cussing up a blue streak, he's smoking a big cigar. So my coat and everybody else's garments that are getting, you know, tailored, you're going to take them home, they're going to smell like cigar smoke, and he doesn't care. You know, so he's cussing, smoking a cigar, and I'm there, you know, filling out the little paper that I'm going to come back and get it in four days or five days or whatever, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, talk to this man about his soul. And I didn't do it. And my wife and I went out of the shop and I opened the car door. She's getting in. The Holy Spirit spoke to me a second time. Says, go back in and talk to him about his soul. And honestly, the man intimidated me. I didn't do it. Got in the car. As soon as I got behind the driver's seat, that burden to do it just sort of lifted. And I didn't think about it anymore. It was gone until the next day. I was talking to a friend on the phone. They said, hey, did you hear what happened to the tailor this morning? I said, what do you mean? He says, the tailor. I said, well, I know him. What happened? He said, well, he walked into his tailor shop this morning. As soon as he walked over the threshold, he fell dead of a heart attack. I said, you're kidding. I said, no. I hung up, and I remember I went and knelt down and realized I had that man's blood on my hands. God said in the book of Ezekiel, if you don't warn, warn the wicked to turn from his wicked ways, I'll require his blood at your hand if he perishes. And I got down and said, God, I'm so sorry. 
I thank God for other blood, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. I repented and said, Lord, wash me clean. I am sorry. Forgive me for my disobedience. Forgive me for yielding to fear. And I made a promise to God. I said, if I ever have the slightest impression to speak to someone again, or if you ever talk to me about doing it, I will obey you. And as far as I know from that day to this day, I've kept that promise. And I share the story for this reason. You don't always have as long as you think you do. You don't have forever to respond. And you know, an interesting thing happens when we know the truth. We say, well, yeah, yeah, I know, but not yet, not yet. Our heart begins to get calloused. And it becomes easier to say no the next time and easier to put it off the next time. And it becomes more calloused and more hardened toward the voice of God. And the fact is we don't all have as long as we think we do to share with people. Some of you, it's been on your heart to write somebody a letter. Do it. Maybe a cousin, maybe somebody you know in jail, maybe somebody else, and, and sh share your testimony with them. Do it. To talk to that neighbor over the fence, you've had the thought several times, well, I wonder if that was God. Listen, the devil will never tell you to share Christ with someone. <laughs> Do it. Seize the opportunity while you have it because we do not have forever to share the good news of Christ. And right now, there is a working of God's grace in the world. As we share the gospel, the Holy Spirit will confirm and convict and convince people's hearts of the truth. But friend, the Holy Spirit will not always be working in that way. Right now, between those two events, during this time of mystery, this time of grace, the opportunity exists. But it won't always be there. Now in a moment, I want to invite you to pray with me. You may have come in here with a friend, maybe come by yourself, but I, I don't think it's a coincidence that you're here or that you're listening to me right now. Now, if I could talk you into accepting Christ, somebody else could talk you out of it later on. But if you respond to a revelation, that if you somehow sense God has been speaking the secret language of your heart, and you know his fingerprints are on your life. And you know he's been drawing you to himself with cords of love. If you'll respond to that revelation, no one can ever take that away from you, friend. It's more than you just making a mental decision to do something. It's you opening your heart to the Savior and being changed internally. Because the truth is, like me, there's more to you than meets the eye. You are an eternal being that will spend eternity somewhere. And it's that person on the inside I'm talking to you right now. It's that person on the inside that the Holy Spirit will wash free from the taint of sin and make you into what the Bible calls a new creation. Now, if it helps you right now, just close your eyes for a moment. Only if you want to, though. Sometimes it helps to block out distractions. And I just want to ask you, if you have the sense that God however he's done it, has been somehow communicating with you. Maybe it was through this message. Maybe through some other means. God has a myriad of ways to speak to people. And you want to say yes to his gift of salvation. There's not a better time than right now. If you're a backslider in the house, you once were on fire for God, but now you're Fire is just about gone out. There's a few embers there. And if you don't fan them into flame, everything's likely to go cold. I got good news, prodigal son. Got good news for you, prodigal daughter. God's not mad at you, but it's time to come home. Father, scouting the horizon, waiting for you to begin to make that move. And when you do, he will run to meet you. I'm just going to count to three. If you want to get into this prayer, pray it from your heart. Talk to God for a moment. 
I'm going to ask you to lift a hand when I get to the number three. And the only reason I'd ask you to lift a hand is I believe it can help your faith begin to move toward God. Because the Bible says faith is always expressed through action. Just think of it as a reflection of your heart reaching up to God. Your hand just is mirroring that. I'll acknowledge the hands. You can put them down. And then I'll lead you in a simple prayer together while we talk to God. One, two. You want in on the prayer? Three. Just put your hand up. God bless you. Hands all over the auditorium. All right. Just put your hands down. Everybody in the house, put a hand on your heart. Tie your heart around these words. They mean nothing without your heart behind them. Just say it out loud. Oh God, I come to you. With all of my heart, I believe. I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ to die and pay the penalty for my sins. Jesus, thank you for your great love that you would sacrifice yourself for me. I believe the price has been paid. I believe you've been raised from the dead. And I accept you now as Lord and Savior. I give you my life, Jesus. Wash me clean. Give me a fresh start. From this moment forward, wherever you lead me, I will go. Amen. Stay tuned at the end of the program today for a special inspirational thought from Bayless. Friend, let me tell you something that I know you don't know. You might think, well, how do you know I don't know it? You don't know me. Well, I just know you don't know this. You don't know how much God loves you. I don't understand. I don't comprehend how much God loves me. We maybe have a thimble full of understanding, but, you know, in, in truth, the reality is bigger than the Pacific and Atlantic o- oceans combined. God's love for you is massive. It is beyond description. Now, I hope you pray that, pray that prayer with us to accept Christ into your life. It's the most important thing that's ever happened to me. It changed me radically. It changed my trajectory. Uh, it changed my eternal future. It, it changed my eternal destination. And it does the same for every person that truly embraces him with an honest heart. Jesus changes lives. But once a person embraces Christ, believes in what he's done, believes he was raised from the dead, what are the next steps that that person is to take? It's very important because embracing Jesus, that's not the finish line, that's just the starting gate. So where do we go from there? Well, I I did a little bit of filming on our church campus and um, I I talked about the next steps that we need to take once we've embraced Christ. I'd like to go to that little video segment right now. I want to share with you some things that will help you because you didn't just hit the finish line. You sort of just hit the starting gate of of a whole new life. And here's some things that you'll need to do. If you want to be fruitful and really enjoy your relationship with God and grow in your relationship with God, number one, talk to God every day. That's called prayer. Don't use some high religious sounding voice when you talk to him. Just be yourself. Be honest with God. If you're afraid, tell him you're afraid. If you have needs, bring your needs before him and ask him to help you. If you need wisdom, ask him for wisdom. If you're you're perplexed about something, bring it before God and talk to him about it. If you're happy, tell him. If you're mad at him, tell him. He knows it anyway. He loves an honest heart. But then once you get through talking to him, you need to get quiet and listen in your heart for him talking to you. Because what he says is more important than what you say and what I say. That's the other side of prayer. We talk to God. We listen for his answers. And then second, get yourself a Bible. They're not that hard to find, at least in most places they're not. 
Get yourself a Bible and begin to read it every day. That's food for your spirit. It's a light on your pathway. It'll give you wisdom on what to do. And God virtually speaks into every situation of our life and gives us wise counsel and guidance. And as well as when we read his word, as well as is guiding us, it literally does build us up with strength. You could say, feed upon the word of God. The scripture says, desire the sincere milk of the word that you can grow thereby. Third thing you need to do is become part of a believing community. Uh, Find a church where people are not ashamed of Jesus, where they love Jesus, where they love the word of God, and and find some community there. Be a part of it. Go regularly and listen to the Word of God preached or listen to it taught. Get involved in a small group, but just get involved with other believers. We were never meant to live this life on our own. And then finally, talk to somebody else about Jesus. Tell someone else what's happened to you. Use your own words. Tell your story. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be polished. Just be honest. Tell someone about Jesus. You'll be surprised. God will use you. And I guarantee you there's someone in your world right now, in your family, in your workplace, at school, in your neighborhood, someone that desperately needs to hear about Jesus Christ. They need to hear your story, and God will use it. Even if you seem to stumble over every other word, I'm telling you, God will use what you say to someone else about Jesus Christ. And if you'll do those four things, talk to God every day, get into his word, join a community of believers, and then tell somebody else about Jesus, you're going to be okay. I thank you for having taken the time to sit with me right here. Actually, I would love to to look at you face to face, enjoy a, a cup of tea together. I'm a tea guy, not a coffee guy. And just talk. I'd love to hear your story. But you know, In your own world, God's going to provide what you need. He's going to provide who you need. And uh, I want to tell you, God loves you more than you have the capacity to understand it. He loves you fiercely. He loves you unashamedly. He loves you eternally. And for what it's worth, I love you too. God bless you. Hi there. I've written a little booklet about the cross something I believe can benefit every believer. We're looking at whether it's a reason for offense or if it's actually God's loving open door to a lost and hurting world. And along with that, I preached several messages in our church recently. These can help equip you to confidently share your faith with the lost. If you're serious about sharing your faith with others, contact us today to receive the Cross Bundle. This booklet and two message series will equip you to confidently talk about the most important decision you made in your life and the joy you found in Jesus. Learn how you can engage the lost so they can cross over from death to life. Request your cross bundle today when you use the contact information on the screen. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.